Good evening and welcome, my friends. It is wonderful to be here with y'all on a, another Wednesday night. The magic is strong. Uh, just really grateful that this is my job. Every time I hear the intro music to my own show, I'm just like humming along and I'm like, yeah, I get the feeling. And I don't know if it's the springtime or since we last met in this way, everyone, I <laughs> I have some body work done by our buddy Topher, who was our guest last vibrant and he crunched things out of me that i didn't i didn't even know could crunch and, and after about a couple of days of integrating that including some external world experiences where the uh the emotional energy that was involved in the places the biofield that he found tension to release for me i had external world situations come up that completely reflected that stuck energy forced me to feel you know, I'll be honest, it was anger energy because I'm the type that that's the one that I'm prone to repress. But I got through that. I felt it. I expressed it. I came through the other side. Uh, the situation that was involved, you know, it was just a one and done thing. It wasn't anything that was big. And after that, I don't maybe it's the springtime, but I think it's the body work, too. I feel really energized to just crush. And I've been <laughs> I feel like I've just been working nonstop since, uh, I don't know, Sunday. And I've got lots of fun things to announce to you guys. I know we didn't have a show yet this week. We normally would do an interverse on Monday, but there are a lot of things in the works and including some stuff that will make it up for, you know, any future weeks where maybe the regularly scheduled stuff isn't, uh, <laughs> isn't necessarily consistent, but tons on the calendar, lots to look forward to appreciate everyone who's here. And I got some fun announcements to get into, but I'll wait till there's more of y'all here. And uh, other than that, it's just going to be me and Gabe hanging out tonight. I'm hoping that he can enlighten me on some of the slick dissonant content I've been missing out on while I've been having my nose to the grindstone. I, I hear that he was really good on George's podcast, Third Eye Edify. And Brandon in the chat already spilled the beans that he was talking about the Odyssey of Homer. So maybe Gabe wants to have some of that conversation with me. You know, I, I like mythology. <laughs> We named this episode Monomythic Cryptomnesia. <laughs> we'll explain what the heck that means, but I feel like it basically explains our life and hadn't even heard of that word till Gabe put me on it, Cryptomnesia. But how are you doing, buddy? It's good to see you. I love you, man. I love you, brother. Yeah, so exciting. Yes, I just discovered this word, uh, crypto Cryptomnesia, from reading uh, uh, Carl Jung's Man in his symbols is where I've extracted this gem. And I realize he has tread a lot of the paths that we benefit from in our work in the demystifier. So that word is totally on our utility belt from now on. And I want to point out, you said, you know, anger seems, tends to be the emotion you suppress and that that's what Topher crunched out of you. That is represented by... Uh, um, Mobius's denial of his number one aspect. So when you say I repress my anger, that is also Mobius in denial of that number one shadow, which is uh, we've kind of been dancing around that MacGuffin of his inability to see his number one nature. And um, and it's funny. So that is that you what happens like out this of you? Does the, the seven get in touch with their anger and then they become the eight, the challenger? Maybe they get, they, they accumulate their anger and it adds them to the one It ticks them over that uh, beyond the line. That's a good point, but that's just fascinating chance because Topher crunched you to give you a uh, in integration of your number one aspect and that was the moment that we cracked through in the Loki series. We're right now. We're in the middle of that episode where Owen Wilson uh, makes eye contact. He actually perceives um, the the nemesis character, who will eventually embody his number one aspect. Uh, but he's giving a, a public presentation. He's in a. He's uh, on the stage. He's uh, he's embodying the muse of Polyhemnia who is the muse of Phaedrus, the number one personality type. And so, yeah, it's just so apropos that we're in the middle of that episode when Topher cracked you and you were integrating your anger. It's like you're 
totally enacting our decoding, our cracking of the code is uh, coming through in your life. That's kind of fun. That's awesome. I totally see it. And I know it's been a while since we began and opened the whole can of worms of episode uh, three of season two of Loki. But that just means when we get back into it, we'll it'll all feel really fresh. I have ambitions to do that within the week. We'll see. It is a bit of a uh, bit of work to get it prepared, but I'm not at the beginning of that mountain. I've already tried a lot of the path, so I think we'll be able to do it. And I wanted to say hi to some of the people in the chat here. I see Zerlath, my wifey, Jenny G, uh, my Cherie here now, Rad Beyond Language, Peter Shell, Rachel Sparks, Michael H, Priscilla, Alex, Kabir, you guys, love y'all. Brayden, yeah, hope I didn't miss anybody. Matt, yes. Brandon Stark, yes. You guys are great. Appreciate everyone who's here, especially, you know, showing up early for the class. Old World Mick Mac, he commented three hours before the show even came on. Good to see you all. Love you all. And we've got to define that word cryptomnesia, Gabe, now that we brought it up. We got to define that because it might even inform some of our conversation. I kind of hoped that it would. Yes. You know, uh, I think we should start with the the definition by the book, uh, just for the sake of formality. But when I laid eyes upon this word, uh, I so much of what I learn at this stage in my life, uh, a lot of when I learn something, it's extra impactful, I think, because I'm I'm retrofitting my uh, my education at this point in, in my age. Uh, so much of what I learn is like, it's not exciting that this is how it will always be from this day forward. It's actually uh, more rewarding to realize this is how it has always been. And I'm just now being receiving the gift of a way to convey it to somebody else. And cryptonesia is one of those words. I want to spell it uh, correctly. C-R-Y-P-T-O-M-N. E S I A. And that M to the N has a very interesting Roman to Greek relationship, right? Uh, that's one of the philological switches, is a Roman to Greek M to N switch. But chance you've told you've said it before. Is it true that the Greeks do not have words that end with an M? Is that is that a, a truism? I don't think they end with M's, no. But I, also M and N, I don't think M and N switch that much. M kind of stands alone. What happens more often is the M is either added or omitted in mystical ways. That's my understanding. Okay. Yeah, I don't think Greek yes. has words that terminate with M, but they do terminate with N. Yes, yes. So like tecton, there's a lot of tons on the end of a lot of their words uh not so much the m on the end so that's kind of uh you can almost see the nationality of language sometimes with uh with that handoff from the m to the n but it's significant to me of course because it's the middle of the alphabet you know that's a, a breaking point it's like that the hinge it's a hinge it's also the m idle but okay i just want to read the technical definition because it gets real cloudy very quickly, uh, but I think it's still very important. So uh, cryptonesia occurs when a forgotten memory returns without its being recognized as such by the subject who believes it is something new and original. It is a memory bias whereby a person may falsely recall generating a thought, an idea, a tune, a name, a joke, they are not deliberately engaging in plagiarism, but they are experiencing a memory as if it were a new inspiration. And so this is a fine line right here. We are walking a super amazing tightrope. And I have a great many examples, but I think the art craft that I do of unpacking Oh, nice, Marty. Big up, buddy. Nice. 
a lot of what I do is actually unpacking crypto nisha that has been inseminated into our childhood into when we're youthful where uh the soil is is uh su subtle and receptive and so a lot of our childhood signs and symbols have unpacked in our adulthood and i think we're having cryptomnesia uh um subsidized or uh, cultivated with a uh, with the Alan Dulles agenda, and th that is very much what I find myself doing. Where I'm like, how am I finding the Ninja Turtles so explicitly encoded in these tarot cards? How is it like? I'm not just it, I'm not just convincing myself of this. This is objectively true that the Ninja Turtles come out of tarot cards. And then I'm like, well, so Bart Simpson is in here. Like all of these cult, your cultural icons of your cult, my culture, MK Ultra, my culture is packing out of an artistic uh, rainbow of numerological symbols, signs, star charts, great major arcana, minor arcana. And what's really powerful is that I've, embedded these into the power sigils of the constitution this is this is built into the constitution this is part of the dna of the counts two 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 the two two shown the constitution has our dna of our symbolic realm uh built into these cards in a most profound and amazing way and then i go and i start extracting cartoon characters from my childhood and i'm like these silly bastards are hoping that we will uh, accept the plausible deniability of the fact that it comes from the things of children. And I don't accept that plausible deniability. I'm not going to just let them inseminate all of our childhood with these, with these systems that they can then pull the puppet strings on later when we grow up and have very predictable returns as an effect from that. And so what is happening is I'm getting a better language to convey the vision of what I have when I tell people that these tarot cards are not willy nilly freedom of association, whatever you think it is, is what you think it is. Uh, I'm trying to point out that there is an objective scaffolding to the system. And it definitely goes back to Ellen Dulles's uh, tweaking and twisting of what Carl Jung laid out uh, about a hundred years ago. So yeah, that's kind of uh, that's the the angle I'm coming at with this new cryptonesia. I think that this cryptonesia is also part of full spectrum dom dominance of the psychology of my culture in the MK Ultra of having a salt and a pepper shaker and a ketchup and a mustard squirter to make a nice Masonic tracing board on every table in America. Man, I mean, there's a lot to think about with this, but I got to first just acknowledge and give thanks to the really kind super chats. First, Marty at the Gnostic Academy coming through with a big gift. Thank you for the donation. Rachel Sparks, always consistent with the support. You guys are the best, really. And uh, cryptomnesia, that's not referring to people forgetting what happened last time crypto hit its all-time high like it did today, I think, <laughs> like Bitcoin. <laughs> but I do think people get amnesia about that because they sort of feel the the uh, intensity of all the springtime energy. And it's like, oh, here we go. We're going to the moon. And everybody, the, the bots are coming out. All the crypto bros are making big pushes. Everyone buy in, buy in, buy in. But the house of cards always loses a few floors eventually. And in terms of using that as a microcosm, I don't know much about cryptocurrency. I'm not going to pretend like I am some kind of expert, but you can track certain elements of the way it trends on. And like anything with human behavior on astrology, on the time of year, on <laughs> world events, you know, the phase of the moon, all of that seems to have some relevance and when we're talking about 
cryptomnesia as a, a method of societal engineering, which I think is a really interesting take, you know, we first have to disregard what you're going to find when you look up the definition of the word. The definition of the word just thinly veils what it's actually about. So they're, they're saying that, oh, this is just an excuse for why people sometimes are plagiarists. As I see uh, Priscilla in the chat, she says, possibly that's what Chappelle did with Owen Benjamin's joke about Bruce Jenner being woman of the year, but not having been a woman for a full year. Chappelle put that joke into a, a comedy special years after Owen had said it. But when Owen said it, it was part of the reasons why he got like banned from everything in the universe. But when Chappelle said it, it's okay. And, you know, nobody points out the, the seeming plagiarism. On the other hand, maybe he heard it. Maybe he forgot where he heard it. Maybe, you know, maybe cryptomnesia as described as a accidental plagiarism does describe it. But the more important thing about this, like the big, big picture, aside from the fact that ideas can be seeded into your mind and then later pop out of the, the fertile soil of your mental real estate as if they were your own thought, like we're talking inception shit, right? That could, <laughs> that's what the ultimate, you know, that's the ultimate form of uh, persuasion is making somebody think that it was their idea. There's no higher, and then they take full responsibility for it and your hands are clean, you know, you've got the clean hands of equity. <laughs> that's a real thing. Uh, that movie is probably very informative about cryptomnesia, but on a larger scale and why I attached the adjective monomythic before cryptomnesia is because I think to some degree there, I mean, we know what the monomyth is, right? There's one story that repeats itself over and over again. There's one pattern in which nature builds and generates. There's spring and summer and fall and winter, and then it all goes again. And all the nuance within that pattern or all of, or you can apply that to the mythology of the, the ancient universal priesthood system as it appears in various forms throughout the world and throughout time that maybe, maybe these uh, so-called ancient Greeks who seem to be just ripping off the Phoenician, Italian, Celtic peoples who were their predecessors. Uh, mythological imperialism is what Dylan calls that, which is a really good term, but maybe who knows, maybe to some degree that's a cryptomnesia thing too. And they just thought, uh, they thought they were making it up for themselves. I doubt it, <laughs> but there's always, it's like this, it's like this label that can be attached to something to give the plausible deniability of the true origin of an idea or a thought. But on the bigger picture, I think if we consider ourselves as, as carriers of the divine spark, as refractions of the singularity and source of all life, and that that life is the pattern that I described with nature being a certain order of operations, the math of it, the ma'at, then it's only natural if we are opening the imagination portal that every idea in the universe where there's nothing new under the sun is a form of cryptomnesia, that every thought we've had uh, before, you know, every idea we've had before, maybe it isn't a dream. I don't know. But man, I and I had this dream last night where I was on a river where it's like a big creek or something and i was trying to climb the rocks on the the edge of this waterway and it was sort of like a rock wall and these rocks were well what was just so intense about it was that it wasn't one of those abstract dreams where you're watching yourself from outside or it's kind of more like a a deep train of thought you know abstract it was every element the the heat of the sun the, the coolness and wetness of the water the slippery, cold slickness of the rock, the sharpness of the edge of the rock, like every bit of sensory input in this dream was as if I was physically there and I, I could feel everything about it. But is that coming from the dream or is that cryptomnesia of times that I've touched slippery, cold rocks and been in the water and, and climbed, you know? These are the thoughts that are, are circling around in my mind about this topic. And it's just a big idea uh, that, you know, this one monomyth even when it shows up in a different form is really an idea we've heard or had before. I, you know, all, all, <laughs> all learning is remembering as they say. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, man. All right. Chance. Let's have some fun tonight. Let's have some fun tonight. So in the vibrant call in telegram, I have shared some of uh, the reading of the Carl Jung's man and his symbols. Big up buddy. Um, 
And so I highly encourage people to get in there and listen to this. There is a, a part in Young's, this is one of Young's final works that he put forward before he passed away. So it's very significant. In this uh, series of works, he says one of the, the one phrase that I find myself repeating the most in my practice is, let's get back to your dream. Let's get back to your dream. And when Carl Jung was saying this, uh, quoting himself, that this is like, it's like his anchor in his work that keeps them from floating too far away from the focus. This is the, the sacred center of the ritual. Constantly is saying, let's get back to your dream. I am hearing in the, in the mystic psychic realms, Bagua Xing Yi. Bagua Xing Yi. And this is a Kung Fu style of walking the circle that relates to the 64. Is it 64 symbols of the I Ching? Is that the right number? Yes, the Bagua is the yin yang with the eight trigrams of the I Ching around it. And it's a, you know, it's yeah. a very like, it, it's a symbol of wholeness, it's a symbol of totality. It's a symbol of all of the forces of the psyche and of nature. And it's considered in the East to be like a really lucky thing to wear. I actually used to wear one all the time before, I don't know, I was like stoned or something at some music festival in California. And I gave away this like badass hand carved uh, jade bagua amulet I had that I'd worn it for so long. Um, you know, and the, even yeah. it, it was one of those carved stones where the there was a piece inside of a piece that was like separate but it was in like uh they carved it inside like they hollowed out one part and and it somehow i don't know if it was one piece originally but basically the yin yang part could spin and it was its own separate piece inside of it but had come from the center of this original piece of jade and yeah that was like my favorite <laughs> that was like my favorite adornment i missed that thing but the bagua yeah that's what the bagua is i'll pull up an image of it yeah okay so you say that in your dream, you're experiencing all of the senses of the elements. I will mention that in my psychic space, I just uh, recently, uh, a fella I'm following, he just, uh, he's going through the patriarchs of the philosophers, and we just got to the pluralists. And so an ex amander has been in my psychic space, which it really confirms the fact that in your dream, you were having both the hot, the cold, the moist, the hard of the rock of the wall, like that you could feel all the pluralism of all the elemental textures. That actually comports to where I've been psychically in a, in a in examandrian context. But that Carl Jung is walking around his patient and continuing to tell them, uh, let's, let's get back to your dream. One of my gurus was a Bagua Shingi martial artist. And so I can actually see him walking the circle in his form when Carl Jung says, let's get back to your dream. And that is his own maxim. That is his own uh, meditative uh, ceremony to come back to the process. And it just blows me away that in Twilight language, I'm hearing the Bagua, the Xing Yi. And he's walking the circle. That's actually, I think, what that phrase translates to, to some practitioners, walking the circle. And so I just want to reflect that back to you about your dream, that uh, while you were climbing on the wall, the Bagua Xing Yi is a, walking a circle that is a boundary. It's that sacred boundary of the sacred self. So yeah, Carl Jung's maxim kind of reflects in your dream. And um, can you pull up the... Hanged man graphic from the vibrant call in line telegram that I shared because a while back in our weaves, you were uh, we were talking about the mem, the glyph of the mem. And I asked you, I was like, Does this look like the uh, the Loch Ness monster to you? And so I went ahead and I made it. This is the graphic from my childhood memories <laughs> of the Loch Ness Monster. Do you see it now? <laughs> I, I just see the letter Mem and then, you know, old Nessie. I mean, you're talking about like the uh, the little 
offshoot maybe is the Nessie neck. I wonder if anybody out there saw Dune part two or has read Dune because that's a really good example of, uh-huh. of this cryptomnesia or intentional use of symbolism that when uh, the characters ingest the water of life, they gain memory of their ancestral lives, you know? So there's a water and then there's memory being transferred. Mem. Totally. Totally. Uh, and that's all, that's kind of something that I'm part, starting to parse out that, you know, we're talking about this monomyth. And for some reason, I was uh, mentally, I was thinking of something that is stable or fixed, more like a stone. You know, oftentimes the symposium is called the touchstone or a, 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 the test. Um but I'm thinking of the monomyth as more of maybe a uh, a fluid uh, bathymetry. I think I'm thinking of bathymetry, like what they would call the global currents. You know, if you want to go from like the Philippines over to uh, Central America, you got to wait to a certain time of year to ride the bathymetry that will carry you to that location. But it's not there all the time, and so I'm thinking of of these nautical correspondences of having the right timing and the right season for these connections in these port, these portals, these viabilities to open up. Uh, so yeah, the mono myth to me is more of a, almost a telemetry data metaphor than a like carved out in stone, always the same, you know? So yeah, that's kind of I'm I'm just seeing our monomyth as more of a fluid um nautical metaphor. Telemetry like that's where data is collected using like sensors or something and is transmitted, right? It's about <laughs> okay. <laughs> so are you suggesting that the like the mythology is telemetry for the the one life the source of life the divine spark itself that it's feeling out the boundaries of how far it can stretch its existence before the distance begins to corrupt its own like code of conduct or its ability to generate and sustain and maintain itself in that extension (laughs) does that make sense because like you know the further uh, the further divided, multiplied, and sep- and distant you get from the center, the more corrupt you get. Uh, you know, each multiplication adds slight errors to the thing. Is that what you mean by telemetry of mythology? <laughs> That's what it makes me think of. I see this. I do. I kind of see this. I like that. I like the way you put that. Um, and part of uh, part of what I'm unpacking is because I'm looking at the Odyssey, it has that return aspect. It has a a lot of people, well, uh, a lot of people would say, I haven't done the legwork on the Iliad yet, but I think the Iliad has that masculine positive rotation. It's very likely because it's masculine that it flows out starting in the beginning and moving forward. And I can actually, I have done some of the legwork. Hold on. I have done the, some of this legwork. Enneagram is mania rage. And that is the opening line to the Iliad. The very first line is mania rage. Sing Achilles, son of Peleus. That is the opening line. The first words in the Iliad is Enneagram. And it's right here. And I've walked on this river Styx many times in my life. And I know the calling of the glory of being a reticent warrior in that that moment that Achilles is frozen, that they're hailing to with that opening line of the Iliad. Now, I have not done the entire legwork to work through the entire epic, uh, but I'm pretty sure it rotates a couple times through the Enneagram. But I have been doing the legwork on the Odyssey. And what's beautiful about the Odyssey is it's feminine. It's a return home. And it's going in reverse from the nine all the way back around to the one uh, because 
its uh, its feminine aspect also corresponds with going through the midlife crisis. The end of the Iliad is the middle of your life. You've gone out, you conquered, you beat, you saw all the death, you buried all the bodies, you know all the carnage, you've done, you've vanquished all the demons, and now it's time to go home and tell and tell the story of how it rolled out. And something that is uh, you without can, going you can way even off say, into La La Land on this. Well, let me, I want to add to that ahead. that you could even consider the Odyssey to be beginning at the midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, Iliad leaves it ends at the midlife crisis. Odyssey begins at the midlife crisis. You know, they're kind of like two halves of some, uh, in yep. a sort. Um, and uh, we haven't talked about this, you but so, did, did you notice the whole space sex space hex thing where they sent, allegedly send the Odyssey to the the moon that no one's ever landed on, or the <laughs> and it uh it falls over and it can't get back. Like that's literally. <laughs> The archetype of Odysseus. It's so silly. <laughs> how do you not know that it's planned to be that story uh, by the name of it? Like, how does no one else notice that? It's amazing. So Old true. World Mick so Mac says, anyone yeah, else gonna lost or just me? You're going to some of the digs we did over on it. <laughs> Mick Mac, you know, we're just here for the vibe. You know, Just uh, let our voices <laughs> wash over you and feel the good energy and, you know, whatever gets in there uh later it'll pop out of your head as your own idea <laughs> incepted by us and you'll have cryptomnesia <laughs> uh also dj mike alpha warrior says that you're gonna, exactly you're gonna right. be on exactly. alpha vedic to do an enneagram alpha cast is that true or they're just doing an enneagram alpha cast with just in general maybe they're just doing one you guys should have gabe on he's the master i'd be i'd be Okay, pick yeah, up where you were, man. Before be posted, because I'm interested in whatever they're doing. Yeah, and I could tell. I could tell they've they've got experience in the enneagram. All as well, all as well. No, but you're totally right. Uh, the end of the Iliad is the beginning of the Odyssey that marks the midwife midlife crisis. Uh, that is a return home, a return back to the to the source. Um. And we uh, we laid out a lot of these uh, artifacts over on Third Eye Edify. So uh, I put a link in the early in the chat uh, so people could check that out. We had a really good time. And um, so uh, I want to actually at this point, we revealed something in the second hour of the chat that has a lot to do with uh, uh, the Trojan horse and what the Trojan horse means to me personally. My Trojan horse has some uh, some insider details that only the initiated would even be able to perceive. And some of what uh, we revealed in the second hour about the Trojan horse is actually uh, correspondent to some of the signs and the symbols of some new projects coming up on your horizon chance. And I just want to maybe uh, give you a chance to share some of the what's going on behind the magical curtain that you've been sweating so diligently working on. Okay. Yeah. We got a nice crowd here at this point. We're, we're good in it. So yeah, there's a couple of things I wanted to announce on this vibrant. And the first one, this is the le less exciting maybe, but potentially it's exciting for somebody. So let me uh, screen share this. Up until now, the only ways that you're able to support Interverse, become a subscriber that gets the premium content was on Patreon and Rockfin. But going forward, I've decided to go ahead and set up the YouTube membership system. So who knows? There may be certain things about that that make it uh, particularly sparkly to somebody out there that otherwise didn't want to mess with Patreon. You know, all of you here, you're already on YouTube. If you were going to super chat $8 or more, uh, consider joining the channel to get the membership perks. Those perks would be, first of all, uh, you get the cool loyalty badge. As of right now, it's just the default ones, but I think I'll come up with uh, a cooler set of badges to you know rep your support level and longevity of support. 
But more importantly, all of the extended content for Interverse episodes is going to be available through the YouTube membership program. Now, in, I'm not I'm not doing away with Patreon or Rockfin. It'll be there too. But, you know, I like the live chat experience. Even when I'm premiering a pre-recorded episode, and so we, you know, people will hang out here for the free half, and then those of us who are uh, able to go to Rockfin will go to the Rockfin side, and the live chat continues there. But it's never quite as lively. It's the interface. It's not bad on Rockfin. It's actually good for, it's pretty good. But the YouTube live chat interface is still going to be the best thing out there. So, um, <laughs> and there's there's something else you'll be able to access through this aside from just the extended interverse episodes, which I'm going to reveal in a moment. Uh, but if you know the difference here is Patreon, I'm only asking for five bucks a month, which is a very humble ask for the the work that I put into this. You know, maybe I, I should should have uh, had foresight into inflation or whatever back in the day when I set that price point up. But I think it's fine. Five dollars a month, you get roughly four or five extended episodes a month, which means you know you're paying about a dollar an hour or more, potentially a better deal than that, right? So it's a really good deal on the YouTube version because they take a bigger cut, thirty percent cut. That means I'm doing it for eight a month. For the youtube thing but you know there's advantages to doing it through youtube so anybody that wants to join that there'll be a join button next to the channel name like right here all times you'll always have the option so <laughs> just think about doing that if you were going to super chat anyway because why not why not just get a month of the premium and you'll be able to get access to the cool bonus material that i do and then okay so <laughs> because I didn't have enough shows. Uh, there's a new show that maybe, it, I'm not sure exactly what the, the frequency or consistency of it will be, but I do have a roadmap for about five or six shows already laid out, and I'm sure there will be more to come. And so without further ado, I'm just gonna play this little uh, teaser for oh, Peter Shell, already a member. What's up, dude? You're the man. So here's your teaser. This is what the uh, the new podcast series that I'm going to be doing is all about. Yeah, the Inner World Podcast. If you didn't figure that out, it's Interverse and Spirit World. <laughs> so me and Dylan going to be doing a show that's just behind the paywall for only people that support me or him. You'll be able to get it through a Substack or through my Patreon or through this YouTube membership program or on Rockfin, but it'll be a pay-per-view system on Rockfin. So it's only going to be people that directly support. So this is going to be the place where I'm finally going to be able to have some of the conversations with Dylan that I'd like where we just go through uh, exactly what I want to talk about from his research and his material. Uh, maybe both of us will just use it as a place to share stuff that we felt like we put a lot of work into that we don't want to go out for free, but we did the prep for. So it's going to be awesome. Um, I'm sure we'll play around with the format and length, but I'm considering like 30 to 90 minute episodes. So some range there, but we have already got the first one ready to go. It's going to come out tomorrow. And Peter Shell, the newest member here, he's going to be able to watch it. <laughs> he's going to be able to be there in the live chat even if he wants. The first episode is called Alien Etruscan. No, Alien Italians. <laughs> and uh, the, the first episodes that we've got mapped out are going to be uh -huh. closely following the, the research that went into his newest book, The True Universal Empire, which by the time you've read that and or watched our new series, inner world, you're going to have a much better grasp on just what the heck is going on in our history, which is exciting. Uh, I'm really happy about it. It's going to be super fun. Dylan and I have been kicking around the idea of doing our own podcast series for quite a while. And, uh, you know, we, we did the first one last night and it was such a good time. He and I have great rapport that it's, 
I see a really good future for this. I have a lot of energy behind this project. I stayed up till midnight, like a solid two hours past my bedtime, just because I was so having so much fun working on it. <laughs> Juan's here, slick looking like a sexy Hermes Trismegistus. Trismegistus. And Zerlath, he gets it. Yeah, the first episode, Alien Italians, because <laughs> Italian has aliens in it. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you guys uh, check it out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's those are my my fun announcements. Um, and I think you're really gonna enjoy it for, and it's gonna bring a lot of value for a really low price, <laughs> five dollars or eight dollars. It's gonna be totally good, really good stuff. That's great, man. That's great. So uh, I had no idea. This is totally news to me as well. Uh, and already i'm like mind blown by some of the signs and the symbols you guys have already harnessed for the cause i love that it's inner mixed with world that is like that was alchemically fated that had to happen so yeah you guys chose so wisely and the uh the character up there that statuesque character i can't help but notice it's like kind of ambiguous if they're facing you or are they facing away it's like just uh it's a reconfigured reconfigure that is like just nebulous enough i love that um no it was my first stab at you, using pull generative up the ai most recent that i sent to you on our, our telegram be okay yeah I'll pull I that thought so. but yeah that I thought that, so. that was generative <laughs> video ai uh that's not going to be the permanent intro to the series but I think we'll have fun and make different intros with different music for every episode as part of the way of bringing some creativity to the whole thing. You know, <laughs> as Dylan said, baiting the, baiting the fishing line with different uh, types of uh, enticements. So the most recent thing is what you want me to pull up. Is that right? Yeah. 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 You're, you're also correct. Uh, the I inner noticed, world is yes. like, in, inner world was faded. <laughs> If I just, it just struck me like, why don't we just make it half of our things, put it together. It's the inner world. It's, it's too good. And it's the inner circle too. Cause only the, only the supporters are going to get this top shelf gravy. Exactly. Yeah, man. And yes. And speak of the devil. Oh, all right. Dylan. All right. I'm so down. I'm so down, buddy. So I noticed that uh, the icon is that helmet, uh, the helmet with that, uh, the, with the mohawk. And this mohawk has taken on a most significant correspondence for me ever since that I have uh, infused the wisdom of the zebra, which is the totem of a uh, Capoeira practitioner. Uh, ever since I infused the wisdom of the zebra with Socrates, I realized that this what is an inside joke uh, of the of ancient knowledge uh, and potential. But this is now not only is the zebra Socrates, but the zebra is now also my Trojan horse um, because of the Trojan head here. That mohawk is the iconic uh, symbol of the helmet of the Trojan. And sure enough, there is no other uh, equine uh, animal with a better mohawk than the zebra. Uh, particularly, I, I mean, it's not just any zebra. This is the mountain zebra. It's the specific breed of zebra that corresponds with the mysteries of Socrates. Uh, but because it's a Trojan horse that tells me about the Mohawk that brings more substance to my corresponding the zebra to Socrates, to the reading between the lines, to inseminating your inner wisdom uh, by what is implied, by what is uh, uh, implicit instead of explicit. And then Chance, do you remember the, the picture of uh, Loch Ness, that little shape, that shadowy shape on the water? that we were in the previous slide. The water of Loch Ness is the striations of the zebra. The Loch Ness monster is the Socrates zebra. And that is something to remember. <laughs> 
you know what comes to mind is there's there's some uh, occurrence of the letter Z and the letter T getting switched up, or and you know or D because T's and D's uh, the Greeks really like to soften T's into D sometimes. So anyway. Or think of the the Zadi letter yeah. from Hebrew. It's like a T and a Z, right? So <laughs> if you look at zebra or the Greek zebra, because their beta sound is actually a V sound, it's uh it's just the only thing different about that and the uh, Tav Bet Hey, uh, like T B E or or Tibet <laughs> Tiva. That's the that's the word for the ark. You know, that's the word for the the chest or the box that contains the law. It's the the mystery in the holy of holies. It's the basket that Perseus gets or the chest that Perseus gets thrown out to sea in with his mother. It's the the basket that Moses floats down the river in. So I wonder, I wonder, because it's kind of like a it's like one of those rules of rule of Kolel things that if it just wasn't for that row in there, <laughs> it's like it's a boat with a row. It's a rowboat. <laughs> you know, zebra is a rowboat. If you if you consider the row to be, uh, if you just kind of separate it from the rest of the word, it's 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 the word for the box or the ark. Totally. One thing that zebra knew was that he canoe nothing at all. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> well, I want I want to know so you fun. know more. So I want you to keep going with uh, some Odyssey Iliad stuff, man. This is good. All right, all right. So, um, uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in another another chapter from the slick dissident project uh the most recent i think three small installments i've had this strange uh attachment to the eggplant the canubis of canoe and <laughs> the nice nice so this eggplant has really uh uh found me it has uh attached to my psychic space and it has to do with my commitment to the leap year. I've made a major adjustment by moving the hermit card out of the number nine position into the number eight position uh, because of the elections, because the, the Overton window is vulnerable during elections. So there is a major, yes, yes, the race is on. The candidates are going to... Uh, Keep everything as provocative as, as possible. Because of this, I have invited this eggplant into my uh, psychic space. It is so fascinating um, because in Capoeira, we have a character we sing about. His name is Obu Chao, is the aubergine. That's the color of an eggplant. Uh, and his character is such that he gets spinning to such a uh, fast degree that he's dangerous. You can't stop him. Um, this aubergine, Oberjow, is also slothful because he's big, because he's large, because he's obese and rotund in his body shape. And so all of these aspects of this uh, e humorized, e humorized character from Capoeira is lighting up this number nine, uh, indolent, slothful, peacekeeper, balanced one um, in a really fascinating way because I'm also reading the chapters in Plato's Republic where they talk about using the techne of the dyers to convince uh, the population that purple means righteous, that it means royal, that it means benevolent. These are the benevolent ones. And so the high priest class who will be wearing the purple murex purple, they'll be wearing the uh, even blue. The murex makes both colors, blue and purple. But those will be the colors of people of the high priests. And we still do this in our language in a most fascinating way. And so 
while I'm reading about the Greeks using the techne of the dyers so that the people who learn uh, civic uh, commitment be, to be civically minded, their language is actually installed in such a degree that they can never uh, have doubt that their government is benevolent. And this is hiding out in a lot of our language. Now, keep in mind, I want to say this. I don't think Plato's Republic is uh, from the BCs. I really don't think it is. Whatever it was back then, it was something else. I think it has been refined and tweaked for social engineering with increasingly sophisticated nuance and cunning and precision. So whatever I'm reading right now, I'm not seeing it as this comes from Plato. That's not really what I think I'm looking at. I think I'm looking at Napoleon's handiwork. I think this is uh, Napoleonic civic design. And this is what the Napoleonic reset wants to see out of us. And so I just wanna be clear that while I'm talking about something that they tell us this predates the Bible, I'm not really inclined to believe that. I think I'm reading something that has been tweaked since the Bible and handed to us to keep us all nice and civil, nice and civilized. And part of this spell is the word poor, P-U-R. And this is where the, the poor and the pure are conflated. And there's something to this, uh, I think, I think over time, the idea of embracing poverty, oh, poor me, woe is me, uh, uh, self-sacrifice as a uh, bozo sticker or uh, giving you uh, cr Cradell. <laughs> okay. Am I good? They got me. Yeah. They, they're really getting you. Okay. <laughs> Am I back uh, on? Let me, let me drop a little translations on there. Uh -oh. You brought up the Euharimism. That's the mythological attributes uh, put upon a historical figure or vice like versa. A... I'm on. I'm yeah. On. You're I'm gonna just... on chance. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think you're, I think you're caught up. I think you're caught up. But, oh, he's out. <laughs> I want to just say he's talking about the poor and the pure thing while we wait for him to come back. The That's 100% part of the, I call that the Messiah op, first of all, that the best guy self-sacrifices, lets the crowd kill him or, or consume him or whatever. That's com like early Christianity is indistinguishable from communism. The therapeutic, the Essenes, whatever you want to call the different sects that arose out of or were centered at Alexandria uh, pre-birth of Christ, where <laughs> the father of history, Eusebius, says that they had the Gospels, that they the Gospels came from there, potentially, that their whole shtick was like giving away everything to the group once they joined the cult. So nobody owned anything. <laughs> it's even, you know, that's a, even part of uh, the biblical thing. Uh, so the poor, like the pure ones of the religion would join by, well, they would become pure by giving them their stuff away and becoming poor. That's totally a thing. Oh, while we wait for Gabe. Let me see what's going on in the chat. Anybody <laughs> have any questions for me? You know, I don't, I don't know if I, uh, I don't know when we're going to see Gabe come back. They really zapped him good. What's up, booty yoga. Aha, there he is. Fairy tale chef, carpe diem thriller. That's a good uh, screen name, de jour. Good stuff. Okay, we're back. And I was just adding to your weave that the the Essenes or the Therapeutes, the the College of Alexandria, the the precursor to Christianity, had that whole thing of poor and pure, where you joined their cult and you gave away everything to whoever the you know the local cult leader was, and then they distribute it. It's proto communism. And that's what Christianity, at least the, <laughs> what's described in the Bible, arose out of. Although, in terms of things predating the Bible, that's not hard to do because there's no text that can be produced that's older than like the 6th century AD. So, it, uh, 
It's definitely not got the antiquity that is claimed. And none of the oldest historians that would have been contemporary or near to the time of Mosaic history ever wrote about Moses or the parting of the Red Sea or the Hebrews fleeing from Egypt or any of that. There's just no precedent for that at all. In fact, they didn't even write about Rome. So scratch your head on that one. Thucydides, Herodotus, neither one mentions Rome. That, that should raise red flags about the, the history of those places big time. But I think you're back. I think you're good to go. I mean, okay, nice, nice. So, yes, uh, there's a fascinating, um, it's kind of, I think of it as where like the uh, ultraviolet and the infrared, or the two extremes, where it's like you're so, you're so poor and you're so uh, self-evacuated that you're uh, that of course the blood of Christ is going to fill the void and give you uh, validation or purify you or make you shine make uh, history shine favorably upon you. Uh, and then on the other end of things, they get the same program for the extreme royals for the people who are kings uh, who actually do have influence and uh, uh, pull the strings in the in the. Uh, the high echelons of the old ways. But this is very much about purple. And part of this purple has, I think, to do with uh, the full spectrum dominance. It has to do with uh, both wearing the royal colors and uh, having sanguinity to, uh, this is a long uh, uh, thread, but sanguinity to a matriarch or a patriarch who uh, was inseminated by a god. And that's why they need so a bunch of gods. That's why they need a bunch of saints. They need a bunch of branches to the tree so that the mafia can all have a seat at the table. Um, but uh, that aside, um, I think that, oh, the purple is in our language today in fascinating and revealing ways because the opening line to the constitution is we the people right there's also a pooling of a poll of the populace that is pooling their labor together to come and have this meeting of the minds this treaty to move forward under an accord or a covenant or an agreement but also i want to uh, also highlight the ink that makes the paper, that makes the contracts. That ink is also a purple or a blue, a sacred dye. And the recipe that goes into that dye probably has some occult ingredients that we don't think about. I know that the Constitution was actually made on goat skin and gall's blood, the blood of a, of a bird, the gall, a sea gall, with iron shavings in the blood as well. So there's something really weird about what they use for the dye and the ink that actually goes in the sacred documents. And if you think about it, if the sacred document of the Constitution is sheepskin and bird's blood, then everybody who reads the Constitution is re reading entrails of dead animals. If you read the Constitution, you're reading the auguries of dead animals. That's Etruscan technology right there. <laughs> The reading, the seeing the entrails and telling a gin's agency is uh, it's still part of the Constitution. But th I've got a, a list of words I'm just going to fire off. And I just want people to think of your associations around these words. It has both to do with like um, uh, v living virtuously, having a virtuous life and altruism and selflessness and being civil and obedient to the written law. And so some of these words have very fascinating ink hiding out in our ink corporation of what we think about when we hear these words. So there's uh, in poor tent. It's important. Think of the tent of the paperwork. You got to put you got to put some ink in your quill. You got to think of the old techne, right? When we used to write with feathers. You got to ink, pour, tent. Well, you got your quill and you got to put the ink and the tent 
to get this important information, right? So the important is in our words uh, still. There is um, inculcate, to inculcate the masses, to, be, to associate the ink with power. This is how the pen is mightier than the sword still today. Uh, also, uh, uh, inquiry. If you want to ask a question to those who are in power, then you better have the ink to worry about if they're going to respond the way you want them to or not. So even in the word inquiry, we have the word ink hiding out. Uh, and then incorporate, which is what happens when you take on the birth certificate. You are ink operated. You're operated by this ink. And so all of these aspects of the ink and the purple and the royalty and the priest class, it is all coming together in a really profound way. And it's not just about the eggplant, although the eggplant is part of it all. I want to also uh, highlight the object that is the, the alphabet ball in a typewriter. Uh, I forget what this thing is called, but it is the it is has all the letters and all the symbols on one sphere on one uh, round object, and depending on what letter you press on the typewriter, this round object it rotates perfectly and uh, and then stamps the letter on the page. And I forget what those things are called, uh, but it is something of a printing press, a magical printing press cipher. Uh, it's a touchstone. It's a cultural touchstone. And it uh, very delicately conveys the ink onto the page, uh, that little typewriter ball. And so all of my psychic obsessing over the eggplant in the ink credible uh, magic that uh, conveys faith and keeps people civil, it actually has another incar inculcation, incarnation in the, the typewriter ball uh, that I'm now thinking of as a, a very mystical uh, symbol, even a mystical implement. I wonder if there are collector's items of like, who has Hunter S. Ty Thompson's typewriter? And uh, you know, what magical potential that would ha have on certain psychic markets, let's say. I'm, I'm actually still kind of reeling about the constitution. <laughs> <laughs> the things that they used to write down is like a purple black ink iron gall never heard of that before but i just reread dune messiah because you know the new dune movie came out i decided i wanted to go back to those books and see what kind of gravy's in there i mean there's so much gravy but just check it this out this is a quote from dune messiah about constitutions because like the main character paul muadib has become the emperor and Someone's asking him about if they should have a constitution because he's just wielding ultimate sovereign power at that point. And he says, constitutions become the ultimate tyranny. Their organized power on such a scale as to be overwhelming. The constitution is social power mobilized and it has no conscience. It can crush the highest and the lowest, removing all dignity and individuality. It is. It has an unstable balance point and no limitations. And then back to the purple you're talking about. <laughs> the the Greek word for purple, porphyra. It's a word that came later to describe purple rashes, <laughs> like if you get a rash on your skin, or think about potpourri in French. Literally, the pori part means rotten so it's like a it's like a pot of something rotten and when you think about this you know mollusk murex thing <laughs> shellfish do smell pretty bad you know once they're out in the open air for too long so it makes you wonder if uh you know, part of this <laughs> that there's something rotten going on <laughs> yeah with the with the constitutions and the, those writing them the tyrannies the ones wearing the purple. It's really interesting how this kind of winks at us through our language at all times. Yeah, man. Yes. And 
you know, another thing about the purple, uh, I think that uh, words that imply uh, sea fish, remember I've got this, I'm still working on that, the uh, sea urchin emergency uh, carry mollusk spell, and the fact that we have a million words in our language that are subtly seeding our consciousness with uh, with uh, uh, hazards on the seashore, and this has to do with insurance. What the in what the shore, what has been rinsed ashore. Uh, it's so weird this whole thing. Uh, but I think what happens is not only do we become like precautious when this is when this spell is like summoned, uh, but I think there's also an implication of subliminally sexualizing the minds of men because we're implying sea fish, then men are going to have a subliminal sexualizing of their, you know, on some Freudian level. And I think our language has been doing this for a long time. I think Freud was probably two or 300 years late to announce to us that we subliminate to our own detriment uh, on in profound ways. The more linear of a thinker you are, are the more you're subliminating a great amount of information that becomes actually a task not to think of the silly little puns. You're actually working hard not to get the joke. Uh, that's what I'm learning later in my life is that languish, the languish of language is working on not thinking of all the things that are really being said. Um, anybody who goes through the, uh, the Carl Jung uh, that I uploaded on the Vibrant call-in line. He talks about that actively. Yeah, buddy. Well, what you just said is so profound that we consider language being a, a system of communication where our minds are adapting to what is the intended meaning. And we're in, but how we do that is actually by a, a process of ruling out through context, everything that it must not mean that it actually could mean though. <laughs> so it's not so much that we infer what each other intended to say through what those mouth sounds or written glyphs mean. It's in it's a process of elimination of what what we assume it doesn't mean that what we're filtering out. That's interesting. <laughs> and you said langu language language, but it's a lingua. It's lingua. It's don't think about lingas. <laughs> don't think about dicks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a joke in it in itself. Totally, man. It is so funny. It's so funny. And, uh, you know, one thing that has helped me convey th this idea more uh, goes back to the Phaedrus, the dialogue between Socrates and Phaedrus, where Socrates uh, makes the metaphor of the chariot. And he has the white horse is like, uh, obedient, well-trained, stays the course, uh, is public facing, is the, the horse that you would brag about. But the black horse is the horse that kind of uh, runs its own course and has a bunch of, it's, it's, uh, it's disobedient. It's the problem child, that horse. And that's not the one you would like brag about to your friends. Well, the funny thing about the black horse is uh, that's where all the puns are happening. That's where all the things that you're, that you don't uh, pick up on, that you don't exalt. All of the sublimating actually goes on to the work that the black horse has to do. And so that dynamic uh, unpacks into life in a million fascinating ways. And sometimes uh, that's what I do. That's what Slick Dissident does is looks at what the black horse is carrying on in its mailbag and being like, you know, what did, uh, what did everybody not want to hear because sometimes that's where the real the real gems are funny because you know we we self-soothe part of that like what did that what does this sentence mean is actually self-soothing to find what you want it to mean and there's a certain tax uh uh, uh getting drunk when you're only finding what you want to hear you're kind of getting drunk on uh comfort 
and uh and then somebody like slick dissident comes along and says oh you didn't know there was an anagram in there all along and they're like oh shit i'm sober again <laughs> so i was just looking over on amazon to see if it was up yet probably wouldn't be it's not quite but i didn't mention while i was making other announcements that one of the other things that i've finished in my <laughs> nose to the grindstone of the last uh, week is I managed to put the final touches on the sixth Spirit World audiobook, Terminalia, which is a really good one. So I'll let you guys know when you can get that audiobook, but it's particularly awesome because not a lot of researchers are looking at the Americas and Mexico and what the Spaniards did and encountered when they came there. That's what that book is about. Uh, also, <laughs> there's about two or three chapters that just put the final nails in the coffin of the historicity of Christianity <laughs> and the, the church fathers, what, what lies about what lies came like from their own mouths, their admissions of forgery and whatnot. And so, you know, that's a really hardcore book for anybody that wants to have all of the details they need to know for sure what they want to know about those subjects. Uh, looking forward to being able to announce that it's out. We'll play the, audio sample later on when that happens. <laughs> yeah. I did a lot of reading of quotations of the Reverend Robert Taylor. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> really enjoyed that. And uh, what else was I going to say? Um, I don't know. I'm just going to kick it back to you, Gabe. I'm enjoying your monologue. It's giving me good vibes. Right on, buddy. Right on, buddy. Uh, yeah, so the another aspect of um, the purple in my read, I think, has a great deal to do with um, this eclipse. I think this eclipse that's coming through, uh, I do, we know that they use eclipse cycles to uh, build up people's uh, a sense of terror or doom and gloom or uh, you know, something's something is impending on the horizon. It's no, that's no that's no mystery. Um, it's even drawing on. You know how uh, if a bird flies over your dog, your dog will like uh, try to grasp onto the earth. You know that's like it's harnessing even that level of the human instinctive response. And if, again, if you are listening very closely to Carl Jung's uh, presentation on man and his symbols, he very briefly mentions the eclipse as uh, a moment for humanity to have a lapse in their reason. He actually talks about losing your sense of reason, uh, and he uses the metaphor of an eclipse. And I found that very telling. His word choice is. Um, it's so subtle. It's so fast. It's so fast. I hate it. It's so fasticated. It's so fast. I hate it. <laughs> uh, but uh, he actually does use the eclipse uh, in in relation to uh, people having um, going into a frenzy, having uh, losing their sense of reason and uh, not thinking clearly. Well, so, it's the ultimate symbol of the enantiodromia, uh, the becoming of the opposite. <laughs> you know, like the, the sun is Thank this constant, you, yes. constant source of warmth, light, energy. And then uh, all of a sudden it becomes its opposite. Day becomes night. That That is the most terrifying thing uh, for a being. A, a being that has evolved and distinguished its own ego self-identity will typically rather die rather than become the opposite of that. <laughs> so... The, there's nothing more terrifying in that sense archetypally than an eclipse if you pump it up the right way. And it's sort of the way NASA explains it to us makes it not seem so scary. I'm not saying people should be afraid of it, but there is <laughs> maybe it's just there so that we can come to terms with and accept the fact that in our our circuit through existence, we will eventually become all things and then those the opposite of those things. Like, And that's why... <laughs> and rather than looking at that as a scary uh, outcome, the way the ego t 
typically would, right? Like who here that considers himself good would ever want to accept themselves as evil. But part of the integration of the shadow is to come to terms with the fact that you are capable of doing evil. And then to even be good, you have to fully come to grips with the fact that you are capable of doing evil. <laughs> it's the people that believe they can do no evil and that they only do good that do the most evil. <laughs> so that's uh, you know, in terms of like not being afraid of that inevitable anatiodromia, the, the becoming of the opposite. And also to not be upset about what you have or haven't attained yet and to just keep do, putting one foot in front of the other and continuing your progress with the work that life is presenting in front of you and embracing that as good and part of of uh, the whole and necessary and fulfilling in and of itself is that uh, eventually you're going to get, <laughs> eventually every experience is going to come to you, whether, <laughs> and it might it might come in the form of cryptomnesia where you think, Oh, this is a brand new thing, even though you've actually had a dream about it before, <laughs> right? So, like, there's nothing to be afraid of uh, experiencing or doing when you grasp that. How do you give something to everything, or how do you take away something from everything? You can't, and that's what your inner world and your divine spark is. Is the is the all? Yeah, man. Yes. Uh, uh, Carl Jung in this, uh, in that, uh, book that I'm, I'm still, uh, I think I'm past halfway, but he talks about the, uh, in antiodromia, uh, in it, it does, it relates to like how, when you draw a bow, you are simultaneously pushing the bow away from you while the other hand is drawing it in towards you. And so there's a, there's a, uh, running the course of these opposites that builds up like a, a an anticipation for the for the release uh, when they consummate uh, somehow. Um, and I and I've also you know uh, the analema is kind of a an antiodromia. If you think about how the sun is literally going uh, in four, four different opposite directions, uh, and then when you twist and turn the analema in on itself, it almost uh, fulfills the description of what they're doing at CERN. CERN is almost like the Analima uh, collapsed in on itself. Uh, and I, I often wonder, I've been uh, uh, listening to some of the scientists around CERN, and it is so fascinating how psychological their, uh, their specialty, their, their specialty at CERN has a lot to do with psychology. And that's pretty far out. That is really far out. That they're more into psychology than they are into protons and neutrons. So yeah, uh, just thought I'd put that put that on the mix. How many times Gabe has? Oh, all the time. You should see all my notebooks. Like you should see all my notebooks. They're just full of uh, one page out of any of my notebooks is a hundred books. You could write a hundred books with one out uh, for one page of my notes. <laughs> yeah, man. Yep. I'm constant. And it does, you know, uh, as long as I write it down one time, the note can actually go away in oblivion somehow just by it going through my head into my hand and then out onto some piece of paper somewhere. It lives longer. Layla. Hey, I'm really glad to see you. Layla. Big love sister. Hey, I'm looking forward to your show on uh, Thomas, Paranoid American. Layla had a show with him. Everybody yeah, Jennifer watched out. it and she was telling me about it. And it reminded me that we really want to have you on a vibrant, Layla, and talk about Albania stuff. Tell, give us the goods on Albania. Because <laughs> I think that there's like a huge untapped well of syncretism and fingerprints of the, the ancient universal system. Get get in here. <laughs> let's talk about it. Maybe we need. Yeah, we, let's do that one day. Uh, can you like DM me or, or email me? I'll remember if you don't, but it'd be really handy if you did. <laughs> uh, where were we? Where were we? What were you saying before the notebooks thing? What were we on? An antiodromia and uh, CERN. Oh, yes, yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So I want to know more 
do you have any of the of the nuggets about CERN and the psychological nature of that work that they're doing there or if it's work because probably a lot of us have seen like the the ceremony that opens the tunnel <laughs> and all of the weird like ooga booga symbolism that they're putting into that big play acting thing right also if if a true philosopher is involved with with the field of physics they would know that what they were investigating was <laughs> with physics is actually the psyche of the cosmos physique psyche you know they're even almost the same word that the the laws of the universe are the exact same that operate the laws of our mind and like any <laughs> any true physicist or philosopher would have to uh, be aware of that and you could never leave you could never leave psychology at the door whenever you were going in to do this investigation of the the tiny particles that make up the inner workings of all matter and energy right do you remember anything about about the the psychology thing there that sounds interesting yes yes i uh, just put a link in the vibrant call in uh chat telegram chat uh bernardo castrop is the name of a very oh fascinating character yeah man yeah i used to be yes. really into bernardo <laughs> Okay. Okay. So yes. So so Bernardo, to me, he serves as a huge revelation of the fact that most of what this is about is psychological. And I'm not saying that they're not running experiments or wasting Brazilians of dollars per second. I'm not saying that nothing is happening. I'm saying that if I was the mastermind, if I was Klaus Schwab, just based on what I know, this 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 little peanut that I have, and I was Klaus Schwab, I would definitely be running these experiments <laughs> with the Enneagram and the archetypes mapped out on a geo-coordinate system to collide these periodic elements and to work the archetypes of the collective systematically. And so... Uh, so often what we do as conspiracy wizards is actually kind of sh uh, showing a bit of our own shadow. There's like a little self-confessional of how black the black pills can be sometimes. You know, it's like, oh shit, slick dissidents figured out how to take over the world, but don't don't give him the powers of control. <laughs> He's got it all sussed out. You get me and Bernardo Castro to work together and we would figure it out. Um, so, yeah, I think it's fascinating that he is so psychologically advanced, and yet he's supposed to be our go-between uh, to what's going on under the ground at the uh, at Apollo's, the abyss of Apollo. You know, that's the, um, that's the, uh, what do they call that? The, the TARDIS. That's the TARDIS. The, ob the oblivion of Apollo is said to be the, the CERN hole. May not even exist. <laughs> the oblivion of Apollo, like Apollyon, you know, the, the god of the pit described in the book of Revelations. That's basically, you know, if you were to boil that down to the original, what I think is the original uh, signification of that, it's the sun and winter concept, right? The sun going into the underworld. But <laughs> as these ideas get, these mythological ideas get blown out of proportion by occultists later who misunderstand it. This is one of the things that's fascinating here is that there's an original system that is seemingly about encoding the processes of nature and when to plant, when to reap and the ability to navigate at night and what stars are going to be where at what season and all of that. But then as that system gets built onto itself, um, you know, other things start getting woven into the mix allegorically. And now it has another meaning that potentially is about <laughs> growing your energy, energetic homunculus inside your Dantian or about working with thought forms. Like I, I wonder, okay, I, I, I start to get very conspiratorial with this thought, but again, I've been revisiting the Dune series, which 
I recommend to anybody that likes this type of thing, especially if they've got sort of the the uh, synchro mystic keys to the mystery system glasses on when they go to Dune because it's got all of the elements. <laughs> but one of the things that goes on in that series is they, or as Frank Herbert pretty much just right out explains how uh, prophecies are seeded at in different cultures uh, so that at the right time, the right levers can be pulled and the right person can be dressed up in the right life events. And all of a sudden you got a Messiah and all of a sudden you got a ferocious warriors ready to go to a uh, whole holy jihad for that Messiah figure. <laughs> and this has happened in history. You know, I, I, I see that with uh, the mythological system being set up so that then you can create a Alexander the great or uh, Augustus Caesar or, or whatever, you know, you just got to, put the idea of, of the virgin birth out there and a few other things and boom, you're cooking. <laughs> but the other question here is that it, are there, cause that, that requires like long-term planning In the Dune series, it's like thousands of years of planning. And then, and then they pull the trigger on it at the time they need it, but they've had that prophecy seated for, you know, ages and ages. And it's also part of the, the pill that is swallowed by feudal serfs that allows them to continue in their toil and in their oppression. So there's a lot of elements, but is there also the seeding of thought forms in the, like with these pantheons and the, the plurality of gods or, or angels or saints or demons or whatever system you're looking at that allows for, uh, access later in some psychic or astral repository to, basically press the right button and now you've sent out the bat signal in the inner world of tons of people that have accepted that ar that psychic thought form or that archetype or that god as uh, a reality or part of their belief system you know and like it's wheels within wheels and potentially yeah, potentially but what is part of the cover-up of history is so that humanity never quite catches wind of how long this cryptomnesia like control panel has been operating inside of the collective psyche. I really wonder if that's part of the reason for the cover ups of, you know, why there's really no history of any credibility earlier than uh, far into the AD period, you know, like it's all asked with theology. You got to wonder these things. Yeah, man. All right. You just said so many things that are, are actually you're like reading the board and you don't even know it like the sentences coming out of you are actually articulations of what's already here the bat signal is okay so this is the leap year the, the revolution is on and the bat signal is the moon card okay so i just want to just real quick I have made adjustments. I'm going against the numbers for the sake of the leap year, for the sake of the revolution. I'm breaking the order uh, very strategically and intentionally. So I have moved the revolution. This is the wheel card. I'm moving the revolution to center stage. This is revelations. Revelations is nothing less than a, re a formula for revolution. Oh, nice, nice. So yeah, Revelations is basically just telling people how to keep the barometric temperature of when it's time for things to pop off. And it's past time. This is it. It's happening. So because I put the revolution center stage, the moon card had to jump out into the reformer perfectionist. And now the moon is with the sun. And because the moon is now with the sun, uh, this is a, a reformer perfectionist with a shadow of wrath signifying the lunar eclipse. The lunar eclipse recipe is making itself, itself come to fruition on the board for chance. And so when you said when they want to pop out the bat signal, I just want to kind of weave a little bit on how this is the bat signal. This is literally the bat signal right batman has his signal that whenever it's time for the emergency for the brooding the brooding bat will put on his, his hero costume and go uh answer the siren call the siren call yes 
But if you look very closely, you'll notice this is the bat's ears are up here. And the bat's mouth is eating this roach right here. And uh, a very long story short, this is encoding batroco, oh my gosh, batrocotoxin. Bat, R-A-K-O-T-O-X-O-N, batrocotoxin. And batrocotoxin is an incredibly dangerous poison. Um, uh, but this is a bat eating a roach. And when you put, when you start, uh, basically how I stumbled into this is I started typing B-A-T-R-O and then my autofill, my auto suggest on my magic scrying mirror uh, filled in betrachotoxin. I was like, what is betrachotoxin? And sure enough, it's like one of the most deadly poisons there are. Uh, it's really uh, obscure, but you know that guy, uh, Ardis, Dr. Ardis, who is telling us that there were 19, there were 19 uh, uh, serpent poisons in the, in the Corona vaccine. One of the things he was harping on was a betrachotoxin. He was actually saying there's betrachotoxin. And I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm like, that guy doesn't even care about the tarot cards. He doesn't care about the tarot cards, but a lot of what Dr. Artis is saying is coming through in the tarot cards. And that just freaks me out when scientists are reading the tarot cards with no context for what they're saying. That really freaks me out sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to consummate a lot of what you just said about the, the bat signal has been, uh, has been illuminated and it's time for all the heroes to come out to party. Put on your spandex, y'all. Well, Gabe, have you heard of Bactria? Like the, the near Eastern region of Bactria. It's like between, I don't know, like Iran and part of India. I don't think it's called that today. But that does ring a bell. So I I don't know this for sure, but I have a suspicion. Okay, because one thing that I've, I've been learning again, like I'll shout out Dylan and his awesome his, history research. But when you look at the like ancient Italians, and we know this about the Kelti and uh, the Nordic peoples, feudalism was not a thing. There was not a very huge distinction in like there wasn't this massive wealth gap wealth disparity between commoners and nobles or you know peasants and nobility or royalty people were closer to the same playing field but that wasn't because of a form of communism it was more because it was like a an honor culture and <laughs> uh, they they made their contracts verbally and they weren't you know they weren't uh bound by the spells of ink on paper they were living in the they were living men and women so you know glory was more their currency probably As, so that being said it's i think it's i don't remember who it was that said this maybe it's a reverend robert taylor quote if dylan's in the chat he'll correct me if i'm wrong but basically that feudalism like the system of lords and serfs is an exotic import like a foreign plant a a uh yeah, like almost like an invader, invading species of civilization in Europe. It was not originally a European thing, feudalism, to our older ancestors. <laughs> but there's a point in history where it appears that like swarms of, of people immigrated from like the Bactria region and into Egypt and uh, Egypt being a power center at that time for this Phoenician... Celtic, Etruscan, uh, maritime, Thassalocracy, <laughs> Thassalocratic empire, seafaring empire, and that potentially it's the Bactrian invasion or wave of immigration that brought a lot of the feudalism ideas or behavior. That might not be the case. It's just a th it's just a just spitballing a possibility because you're talking about this type of back bad poison or. <laughs> What, what is it called? I can't remember the word, but do you see where I'm going with this? That like, this is the poison that, uh, that brought yeah. down the, like that changed the Western civilization permanently. Yeah. Yeah. I could see this. It, uh, Betrachotoxin 
is the name of the poison. And that is kind of, uh, I could see that being symbolically correspondent because it's like, uh, it's how you, uh, it's a, uh, it's underdog technology. Oh, nice. Nice. Big up, big up. Yeah, underdog technology. So it's like only a little bit of this poison can take down a huge elephant. Uh, so it is, it's uh, definitely the kind of spy craft kind of alchemy that uh, would be kept under wraps. And then Chance, I'm going to, I'm going to reveal something that uh, uh, just, for, you know, on this weave, we're talking about social engineers, the monomyth being maybe more fluid than solid, uh, having uh, seasonal, uh, I think of um, uh, a civilization is like a homunculus in and of itself. And the civilization has its seasons of its life cycle. And, you know, from studying the Greeks at the, it just at the precipice of their life cycle before uh, their collapse of that, of that social construct, I've learned a lot about where we are now on the precipice of this, you know, turning of a new revolution. Um, and I just want to share something. Uh, this is uh, one of many really fascinating reveals. Um, but I know Dylan's Dylan's in the chat, so he's probably gonna he's probably gonna get a kick out of this. So I don't know how long this enneagram has existed, and it was yeah, probably read, read that named, out loud. has had the feudal system. In Europe is an exotic plant, but in the East it is indigenous, universal, and immemorial. From Richardson, cited by Valency, not Higgins, like I thought. Thank you, Dylan. Valency. Nice. So I don't know how long this social uh, engineering mechanism has been in play. But some of the largest thought forms that have come through this Enneagram are echoing some very fascinating characters who we happen to know are landmarks on, in the course of history that have got us to these ways of thinking and speaking and relating to history. And so... Uh, uh, this is a long story, very short, just for the sake of expedience. you got to take my word on quite a few things here. But there are three dividing groups uh, in the Enneagram. There's this, uh, the 789 is a spear. That's why they're colored in the red. They're the most assertive. The 1, 2, and the 6 is the most uh, 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 passive or um, neutral, compliant, you could say. And then the five, four, and the nine is the most withdrawn or removed from or remote. Um, and what is fascinating is that these three groups are called the Hornavian groups. The word Horn the Hornavian groups is an anagram for Ophanum and throne. Throne, Ophanum. The word Ophanum means thrones. So the anagram itself is self-referential within itself. So it's unpacking in multiple languages. Okay. So the O Phantom Thrones of the Hornavian groups are the angelic heroes of our world. And 783 is the Michael. This is the Archangel Michael. This is Archons. These are the Archons of Archons. And now I'm handing this over to everybody. The Archangel Michael is holding the 783 of the Hornavian groups. The Archangel of Gabriel is holding the 1, 2, and the 6 spear of the Hornavian groups. Dylan, the names Michael and Gabriel are hiding in the name Machiavelli. Machiavelli has Dylan's middle name is Michael, you know. Essence. Well, I'm Gabriel. So between Dylan and myself, we are holding the uh, the O Phantom and the Thrones. Maka, Machev, Gabriel, Maka Gabriel, Maka Gabriel is Machiavelli. 
Machiavelli's name is Michael and Gabriel holding the primary thrones of the Enneagram. And now I'm going to do the same thing again with another very significant patriarch of history, a very significant social engineer. This is Apollo. Apollo is the quintessential number six personality type. This is Neptune, the quintessential number three personality type. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take Apollo, Neptune, and I'm going to write it two times. Apollo, Neptune, Apollo, Neptune. And then I anagram the whole M effort out and I get Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte's name is hiding out in Apollo, Neptune, Neptune, Apollo. Napoleon Bonaparte is hiding out in the three to the six associations in this Enneagram. I am here to tell you they have Hellenized our psychology a very long time ago. And the patroness saint of Helen, who is the name of the island that Napoleon was retired to, she is the patroness saint of uh, difficult marriages in archaeology. And they have Hellenized our psychology into many difficult weddings and difficult, difficult correspondences. And now I'm going to do one more just like that. This thing is real as fuck, bro. This thing is real as fuck. This thing is 10 times realer than any Napoleon name that people get out of the books. This thing is real AF. I'm going to do one more for you. I'm going to do one more for you. Zeus, Hera. Zeus is the seven. Hera is the two. We all know about the 72. We all know about the 27. We know how magical these combinations are. Zeus, Hera. Zeus, Hera. Zeus, Hera. Zeus, Hera. Sorcerer. This is the sorcerer's stone. This is the sorcerer's stone. And everybody wants to run around and make all these gods into like some amalgamation of the sun. Mm -mm 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 -mm. These gods are in your DNA. These gods are your freedom of association. And that will set you free. That's your First Amendment. That's your First Amendment right. This is your freedom of association. And it's important you know how to migrate through your ability to associate. And you don't get caught up in your one perspective to rule them all. And you know well, that's the what other the sun is, though. That's what the sun is. It's the right. migration of your perspective. So when we see that in the system, uh, there's symbolic and etymological background that brings everything coming back to the sun over and over again. But it's like Crow has said, the sun, uh, the, the Zodiac is like different characters all played by the same guy, uh -huh. the guy being the sun. Where the light shines is where your awareness goes. So it, it makes perfect sense what you're saying. You know, it's kind of a bothism that because uh, <laughs> the sun can only play one role at a time, just like you can only think one thought at a time. You can only put your mind in one shine your light of awareness. You can only look like, you know, there's 360 degrees around you, but you have to turn to see somewhere else and your point of attention can, even though you have periphery vision, as in, you know, 180 degrees of the dome is visible at once, but yet you can only put your eyes on like one moment in the sky, in the stars. <laughs> some you're blowing my mind totally. with some of these anagrams, the <laughs> Zeus Hera sorcery. Can I tell you a funny joke? <laughs> Bad, not a, not really a joke, but this is something I thought of you when I did it. Uh, my sister had a, a, birthday party for my nephew. He just turned one shout out Sterling. He's absolutely crushing. And, uh, she had, her house was just impeccably decorated and cleaned up and everything was awesome. And a bunch of people came over. So I had to figure out what could I put out of place? And in her bathroom, she had a sign with uh movable exchangeable letters, right? So you could put your own message on this sign, little white letters that just click into a, like a, a slats on a board. And it said it was sitting on the top of the toilet and it said, please seat yourself. And I'm sure she thought that was really funny. But as soon as I saw letters that I could rearrange, I hear Gabe's voice in my psyche going anagram, anagram that shit. 
<laughs> so I, uh, I did my best to come up with an anagram with using as many of the letters as possible. I had to leave a few out, but I changed it from please seat yourself to fatal leprosy. And that was now the sign <laughs> over the toilet. <laughs> and to my great annoyance, nobody commented or said shit about it. And like my whole prank just went without the attention that I so badly craved. But <laughs> I was thinking of you when I did that. You know, you're the guy that's getting me anagramming everything. Oh my God, that's so awesome. Fatal leprosy. That's beautiful. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. So uh even like you were saying about like when you're looking at one thing, you uh the other half is is kind of missing from the picture. That's exactly what happens with the balancing of the seven to the two. Uh, the seven implies the two because they have to come to balance with the nine. And so that's kind of the wedding of Zeus and Hera. And also, you know, while Zeus is always running around uh, getting his freak on, Hera is always wondering where the hell he is. That's like their dynamic is like he's over here. Well, she's and it's implied that she's jealous and she's pulling strings that he's going to have to pay the dues when he comes back to her, when they recognize each other. So I love the way you worded that. It totally balances the seven and the two components. That's great. Well, you know, uh, earlier in the week, Jen and I wanted some content uh, for, you know, some movie time or whatever. And I was like, I, I'm tired of all of this dark, evil shit. So let's find something PG. So we watched the the television Disney plus adaptation of uh, Percy Jackson, the Olympians, which I had never, you know, I didn't read those books back in the days when Harry Potter was a thing. And that book seemed, those books seemed like they were kind of uh, an attempt to cash in on a, a popular formula. Right. And they, and they certainly were, there's a lot of stuff that overlaps from all that, or is it the monomyth? Who knows? <laughs> but what uh, I, one thing that I noticed in that show you know, and it wasn't bad. It was entertaining. And it was PG. It wasn't all like dark and horrific. The The main character was a, a heroic and noble one who like a heroic masculine figure that didn't seem to have any like plague of, of shadow traits and behaviors. None of this anti-hero corrupted hero bullshit. It was just like a, a good guy who wanted to do the right thing. <laughs> so that's refreshing, right? That's how I like, that's why I like Lord of the Rings. The, the heroes are actually just good. That's what I'm about that. But uh, there's a, a a part they just go through in passing. I'm sure this is similar to American Gods, which I never read or saw, but that Zeus admits that the wars that he's fought with his brothers, Poseidon and Hades, that when those wars are fought, like the last time that they fought a war, World War II popped off down here. And when you think about what that might be revealing, in terms of the levers of the psyche that one <laughs> one human psyche contains all the collective human psyche you know we we usually think about that in one direction like um i contain all the same parts as the whole universe but no man i'm saying that like your mind is the same thing without any borders boundaries or separations as the entire cosmic universal animating force that is the divine creative intelligence it's the whole thing <laughs> So when Zeus and Poseidon go to war, human beings go to war. And there's like, there's a profound, there's a profound mystery to that, which is very hard for us to wrap our minds around in our single pointed uh, limit, like limited <laughs> scope of awareness in our, our mortal incarnation. But I, I found that really profound. And I think there's, there's something to it that reflects what you're talking about with your, with this uh, great Enneagram chat we're having nice buddy yeah man um i've been thinking of the same thing how the battles of the heavens are actually like inevitabilities of social contracts or social um dynamics uh uh playing out over and over and in, in repetition like when i learned that one of the uh one of the things that they accused Socrates of was being um, the way that they worded it. They 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 were accusing him of being 
maliciously iron, ironic. And that that was th that when the people, when the, the rebel spirit is voicing itself with like aggressive irony that the uh, the the judges or the the civil controllers they consider that like a pressure valve like uh oh these guys have figured out how irony works that means our 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 days are numbered and we got to take this guy out because if his irony catches on and then the kids are going to come along and start using it and sure enough it turns out if you're reading really close in the details some of Socrates' fans, the people who are like exalting him, they even after he's dead, they're like wandering down the streets barefoot, trying to like be uh, a, a philosoph. And their friend comes up and is like, "Hey, why don't you tell me about the symposium? Weren't you? Where, don't you know the story of the symposium?" And he doesn't want to tell the story of the symposium. He wants to get in a a, a, a philosophical wrestling match and he tries to actually entice him into a philosophical conversation he's like dude i'm not here for philosophy don't try that on me and so his failed attempt to to bait him into philosophical uh 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 dialogue is really funny because it's a beginner's effort to be like oh you think do you think you know something because i could maybe cure you of that and he's like, I'm not here to be cured of what I know. I'm not here for your wannabe Socrates attempt. But the, that little line, that throwaway line, is the remnants of aggressive irony being passed on to the children. And they're trying to pick it up and be like, you know, to get social change sparked through conversation. And so when I learned about that, I was like, this is where we are right now. This is what the memes are all about. The memes are picking up that aggressive irony to be, get people to actually question uh, the way things should be and the way things are going. So I just wanted to make that point. And then also the eschaton. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hold on to the eschaton. Don't lose that. But Gabe, what, what does Socrates say in his last words? I owe a cock to Asclepius. Now, who does he say it to? Uh, Crito, right? Yes. So there's some irony right there <laughs> that's super weaponized because uh, irony being that irony is when like um, somebody knows something that the characters don't, but it's reverse irony. Socrates knows something that the people in the audience of that don't know, right? And the interpretation of Socrates telling Crito that he owes a cock to Asclepius and asking him to pay that debt for him is it's profound because it's inter like how I've seen that interpreted is like the, uh, <laughs> the caduceus wielding medical institutions and mafias of the world will like cite the, the oh poor Socrates, you know, he, he's saying that healers because Asclepius is a healer. They are obligated to speak out for the weak, the vulnerable, the sick, the suffering that the, uh, and then what do we see during cooties is like, who's making the decisions for society? Who's speaking up and speaking out in ways that is sh navigating the ship of state towards a particularly prescribed direction. It's the <laughs> institutes of health and the CDCs and all that. And they're doing it under the, the talismanic moniker of, or like word of the public health, which does not exist. There's no such thing as the public health. It's a abstract term, but then you have your more like Gnostic bent people uh, of which there are many, like just, it's a, and I, I don't mean Gnostic, like Marty leads Gnosticism or like actually knowing, I mean, the, the, the flesh suit is a prison and the world is a, 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 a fallen degenerated place and all that. And people will say that, Socrates, you know, he thought that life is an illness of the soul and that he's refer referencing Asclepius because he's about to be cured of the disease of the flesh. <laughs> like, oh, it's just such bullshit. What, but what is never like the, the irony of all that is, first of all, Asclepius is a type of 
uh, and we know that these Roman or these Greek philosophers likely didn't even exist and they're just part of a, a mythos, right? Like many other things that are presented to us as history. But Asclepius, he's a type of Jesus Christ. He's an earlier precursor to it. The <laughs> in Terminalia, the book I just narrated for Dylan, there's lots of lots of stuff that demonstrates that right out of the words of the church fathers. Like I think uh was Justinus or Justin Alexandrinus, maybe that is trying to convince someone that he's writing to about uh, why to accept the the Christian cult and basically saying that of Jesus is exactly what you people believe about Asclepius because they're the exact same. Uh, they're exactly the same figure in the system being the preserver savior part of the Trinity. <laughs> so in, in ancient Greek, one thing that you learn once you get into the philology, especially especially the Greeks, is that their letter T and their letter S would often interchange to the point where they even had a letter called Sigma Tau that was both. So when you see the word crease, uh, crease or cress, you also are seeing will often see the same thing written as Crete or Crest or Crest or Cret. So Crito. If that T was just a Sigma Tau, it's Christo. <laughs> and what's happening? Socrates is going to die, but you give a cock, the symbol of the morning, referencing the metempsychosis that, you know, uh, the death part is followed by the morning. The night is followed by the morning, the rebirth. So that's just you bringing up Socrates and irony. <laughs> I wanted to like really make that point that the irony is that nobody fucking notices that Crito is Christo and he's talking about, and there, we know that the cock is a, a symbol that gets connected with Jesus. And it's also connected with Yao or AKA Jehovah, you know, the cock three times Peter denies or whoever denies. I don't know. You guys get what I'm going with this. Ancient Greece always talking about cocks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there's our, there's the, uh, the, <laughs> Always, totally. <laughs> There's the filtration system of the lingua, the linga, filtering out all the dicks out of the the secret meanings of words. There it is. <laughs> Good stuff. So, so one of the uh, one of the things about Socrates' last line that I love is it's uh, Gallo's humor, and Gallo's humor is one of the signatures of the Gauls. But it's also the signature of that North Pole star, because uh, Yggdrasil is not only the horse that he's riding, but it's also correspondent to the gallows. And so that uh, uh, Draco constellation is basically a, a crane. It's a very large crane holding up, exalting that uh, North Pole aspect. So when he's lifting his finger and grabbing the cup, and making a gallows humor joke on his exit line is totally uh, hail to the Gauls. And the Gauls are notorious for making their last line is like some quintessence of uh, their exemplar. Uh, it's actually revenge. Socrates is getting revenge. He's making a dark, morbid joke that millions and millions of generations are going to consume this and be like, Oh, life is a prison because they don't they don't have that Socratic irony. Um, and then there's something else really dark chance because you're right. This is the seed of the Gnostic prison spell in that in the art, multiple artists have depicted him because he's in prison. They've depicted him in that final moment. He's pointing over his shoulder. And. He is in the position of cancer. He's the that exalted going, you know, across that equinox. No, the solstice, the summer solstice. We're going through the pinnacle of the heat from the cancer into the Leo. He's reaching to grab that cup. The cup is the crator constellation right here where the poison hemlock is. He's in cancer. He's pointing up and over his shoulders. There's the links. There's the chain links because he's in a prison. Lynx is literally this constellation right above him in Cancer. And there's also an oil, a little minor oil lamp. There's a tiny oil lamp, always. That's Leo Minor. So the whole painting is always a cosmodrama and him pointing 
pointing to the sky is literally cancer pointing up and the links of the chain links of the prison is literally uh, one of the uh, roadmap uh, markers that gave me the ability to uh, translate the scene of Socrates dying into basically, I think that's really a Hail Caesar. I think when they put the, the hero, the, the heart hero of you, all your chest feels, they put it in cancer uh, so that you channel your veneration to that Cancerian icon. It's really hail to the Tropic of Cancer that has the Caesar, you know, the flag of the Caesars, the, you know, the highest exalted ones, those who are going to tell the story, really. So that's why he's got to be in the Cancer spot. I never thought about links as like a link before, <laughs> but it's interesting because in the context of the the holy sailors and the facilocratic empires of whatever the our ancient ancestors were up to that's been concealed by the current power structure and mosaic history, that you you know, you've sussed out that there's something up with cats, <laughs> something major up with cats. And cats, have you ever considered that cats uh, are sailors themselves? That of in, of all the animals that are sort of parallel to humans, but not fully domesticated because they are self-sufficient and do their own, their own thing, they just hang around humans, cats would get on sailing ships and they would get taken around from place to place. Uh, even, you know, the inversion and the irony in this that, because we, we know that the the ancient Britons and Irish are basically the same people or of, of the same stock come from the same people as the, the Phoenician Etruscans, the Celtic, that they have a, a superstition, British and Irish sailors, that a black cat on your sailing vessel brings good luck, not bad luck, that the black cat is good luck. You know, uh, it makes sense that they, they're great for, taking care of your uh, stocks of grain or whatever you're shipping around because they'll take out the vermin. But Gabe, there was one thing I told you to hold your thought on, and I don't know if you you got back to it, uh, but I'm ready to move us towards the wrap up. So uh, if you have that held thought and maybe cat thoughts, yeah, buddy. you can get those in. All right. All right. So uh, yeah, very interesting that we got, we ended up on cats on boats because when I moved the hermit card into the number eight position, which has the lust card, this is uh, Grab Him by the Pussy. This is Jizz Lion Maxwell. Uh, this is Marilyn Monroe. Dude, this is Marilyn Monroe because it's the, this is the uh, Mar Roman salute, the Mare Lion. Monroe. Um, there's Marilyn Monroe, dude. This is her name is encoded in this card because of the Roman salute. Um, but then also grabbed by the pussy. This is the Jizz Lion Maxwell. It's so fascinating how many signs and symbols are right here. They just unpack these cards uh, over and over um, for the controller aspect. This is also, um, you know, Iceberg dude, you know Slim. Donald Trump uh, is a, a Leo yeah. rising. Trump's I ascendant did not know is that. Leo. That's very yeah. So he come ascendant means he that comes off like a Leo. He looks like a Leo. Yes, it totally tracks because of the grab by the pussy and like the golden showers. You know, he's into golden showers. It's like it's crazy. It's crazy how how uh, this says more than a million headlines have ever said to you. This picture is saying more than all the words you got off of any newspaper ever. And then I want to let's just mention that the news only looks at the fourth wall and the film never looks at the fourth wall. And so they put reality in your film and lies in your news. And so the fourth wall is also part of the, the mix here. But it's funny that we're talking about cats on boats because I just moved the boat of the full card has the Argos constellation. Is Let right me just here next tack to on to cat. that real quick. The, the fourth card. estate is what they call yeah. the media. They call the news the fourth estate. It's the fourth wall. Yes, yes. Oh, shoot. Okay. 
I hope people do get around to listen to that Carl Jung uh, man in his symbols because Carl Jung has a term. He uses this term, your Bush soul. Okay, he's speaking very politically incorrect. And if we allow ourselves to be brainwashed of uh, or too, made too sensitive, if we are made too sensitive, we're not going to be able to read his words anymore because he literally talks about like your lower base desires. He talks about Native American and indigenous people. He calls them primitives. He uses this language that like has me clutching at my pearls. I'm like, oh my God, he, they used to talk that way? Yeah, they used to talk that way. And one of the terms he uses is the Bush soul. And he's talking about Native, uh, uh, like Aboriginal people. Oh, doggone it, Chance. Okay, I know we're going to the end of the line, but I just want to mention Aboriginal people who are like, think about it. Think of how uh, my opinion of people from uh, from down under in uh, in Australia, they are the pure, they're like the purest, most in touch with dream time, still communing with the 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 bio sphere, the full spectrum of the realm. This is amazing, but the word Aboriginal and the word aubergine. This is my eggplant again. This is my eggplant again. These people are extremely dark skinned. They're so dark skinned that they're almost purple. And think about how pure their soul is and the fact that they have access to dream time. And dream time is depicted as a purple twilight realm. It's like dark so the on the aubergine, outside, inner, inner world light. Like lit up. Yes, yes. So the aubergine of the aboriginals and the twilight access of that purity of spirit that is still preserved down under in the hangman card of Australia. It's very profound. And I want to mention, oh man, I know we're trying to get to the end, but the cave of day and the cave of night in Plato's Republic is also uh, astrological. Here, I got to put my fingers on it. The one cave is Corona Borealis, which is a really obscure anagram for uh, aubergine also, and Roy G. Biv, the full spectrum of Roy G. Biv. I think this is the cave of the night from the uh, the dialogues of the, the myths of Ur. And then Corona Australis is the exit to the cave that comes out under the legs of Sagittarius. So I just wanted to put these things on the record because uh, they might pop up later in some of our future weaves, that the cave through the underworld of the fall time of the year, I think it has an entrance in Corona Borealis where you go into uh, dream time, into the under, into the beyond, and then you pop out in uh, Corona Australis is the exit of the cave. And that's where or Orpheus's head is still said to be singing out of. And then one last thing, so we don't have any dangling chads, as we're calling them now. <laughs> um, the hecatome and the eschaton. These are essentially one and the same. Uh, it, it's, um, once upon a time, they called it a hecatome. And some people today prefer to call it the eschaton. And this is when the shit hits the fan. It's the eschatology of the end times of it all. I may I might be about to jump ahead of you, but I just realized the the judgment card, <laughs> the end times, you know, is XX. Ten times ten is a hundred hecate hecatone. Greek, a hundred hecatone. Whoa. I broke Gabe. He's frozen. <laughs> oh yeah, he sees it. Okay, he's back. <laughs> Nice, buddy. Totally. So this is the new ages. This is the aeon means that an ages, an age. An aeon is an age. But the age is the ages. And the ages is the charge. This is the new charge. But yeah, I dig it, buddy. The double X of it all. Very fascinating. Um, so yeah, um, the eschaton, the hecatone, uh, it's just fascinating that... Um, the collapse of empires 
follows this this monomyth. It follows the monomyth, and we can map it all out. Like, yeah, it's all it's all here. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. You know, it's time for the frenzies to pop off. Uh, so yeah, uh, those are those are some of the thoughts that have been on a slick dissident's mind for the past couple of weeks. Um, how the benevolent uh, programming of our mind is actually inseminated through our language and our words to steer us to believe that they can never lie away our sense of their benevolent, benevolent, benevolent. <laughs> their benevolence is hidden out in this purity of the purple that is implicit in our language in a million trillion different ways. So one more question. This is from like over an hour ago, but <laughs> in the chat, when you disappeared, I was like, anyone have any questions? And one person dropped one and I liked it. So I saved it for later. Fairy tale chef Carpe Diem Thriller asks, if you could be given one missing artifact from history, what would be on the top of the list? So I'll answer first. I, I don't know. My answer might change on a different day, but I would really like to see the paintings that the ancient Mexica had when the Spaniards showed up because allegedly they had these paintings that contained all of their history. And then that was destroyed by <laughs> the Spaniards and the conquistadors and the inquisition. So their history was, uh, you know, really muddled and grappled from that point. Cause that was where they were keeping it. I would love to see those paintings cause a it'd probably be really interesting artwork and B it would shed a lot of light on just what the hell, uh, how they got there and why they had the same system as the, uh, the, the old world priesthood. What about you? What what missing artifact from history would you like? Or maybe it doesn't even have to be missing. You know, if you could just have the Indiana Jones gold monkey head, or what would you pick? Paul Young's Agatho Damon ring. Whew. You had that like an Abraxas ring, right? That, I want. that is my... Yes, yes. I believe that this is the... Uh, I think this is the the ring of uh, Gyges. I think it's the ring of Gyges. I think it's the ring of Solomon. The word Carl G. Young is a slick dissident approved anagram for conjure ring, conjure ring. And Carl Young's Agatho Damon ring has fascinating implications. Uh, as it relates to its two-sided nature. One side has the dragon. Uh, I think it's the dragon of the Indus constellation specifically. I've mapped this thing out. It's not just any Hydra, it's the Hydrus. And it is, it's hiding out in this image right here. And on the back side of the same ring uh, hidden is a, uh, is a lion, but the lion's head is actually removed. There's a missing stone from his ring. So there's still an artifact of mystery uh, as to where that little chip from the ring is located. And strangely enough, well, the lion's head also uh, fulfills the star card, the shape of the star card. So you take this and the star card, you put them together and you're looking at Carl Jung's ring. So yeah, that's the artifact I want from history. Nice question. I love it. Dylan says he wants Emperor Claudius's alleged lost book, Tirhenica, about the Etruscans. That would be that would be a good one. Man, can you imagine the books that are lost that we don't wow. even know existed? So, guys, we're going to wrap it up. I want to remind everyone lots of ways to support Interverse. They're always going to be linked in the uh, episode descriptions. But to name them off real quick, there's, of course, always Patreon and Rockfin, the classic method of support that gets you the extended episodes of shows and exclusive content. You've got interversemerch.com. Go check that out. I'm going to be making some updates to that merch store soon, I think, but interversemerch.com. There's a lot of fun items there create, created by me. Uh, you can always donate on Cash App at dollar sign Chance Garten or the same for Gabe, dollar sign Slick Dissident. Support him. I've received some super chats tonight, which is awesome, and I appreciate it. But Gabe did a lot of heavy lifting to carry this episode, and he deserves support too. So if you've got Cash App and want to send some funds his way, we'd appreciate it, both of us. 
You can check out the Spirit World series by Dylan Sicosio, narrated by yours truly. There's about to be a brand new one out. Those audiobooks are going to be at Audible, but just check the description in the show notes for links that will get me, uh, you know, the proper credit for referring you. You can buy from Clive to Carl with my link that you can get yourself vitamin C or someone was asking me about a good source for iodine. You know, they're all the basic foundational supplements are going to be really high quality from Clive. There's the, the aqua cure. I don't talk about that very much, but I use it every day. George Wiseman's aqua cure. That's also excellent. Uh, but the best way I think other than supporting the content and getting the bonus content to support me and the channel is to get a, a biofield tuning. I've had such awesome results and they continue to astound and amaze me. And if you want to get a tuning sooner than later, you always got to keep in mind that the booking for that is usually running three, four, five weeks out, depending on the time of year. <laughs> I think right now there might be like one or two slots within a month, but for the most part, it's as usual running about four to five weeks out. So, you know, don't wait. If you're thinking about it, <laughs> make it happen. Interversepodcast.com sound dash healing. Now it's time. I'm going to remind everyone that you can become a YouTube member subscriber now, like Peter Shell and Machine have done. And if you do that, you'll have access to the awesome new series that we're putting out, me and Dylan, Inner World. That's going to still be available on Dylan's Substack or my Patreon as well. So don't have to do it through YouTube, but that'd be a fun way. Machine says, joining here on YouTube has the same content as Patreon. Yes, but Patreon has got the archives going all the way back to you know, stuff that I'm embarrassed about because it's so old. <laughs> Right now, uh, YouTube, I've uploaded most of the extended content from 2024, which, uh, and you know, I, I'm, if you maybe asked for something specific, uh, in telegram or something, I might be able to hook it up <laughs> on the YouTube side, but more or less, I'm just planning on updating it with the exclusive content going forward from now rather than retroactively. So. Patreon is always going to be the best bet, but if you like the YouTube interface or it's just more convenient for you to do it through here, you totally can. So I think uh, I'm going to end the episode with this teaser for tomorrow's first episode of the Inner World podcast. Thanks again, Gabe, for the awesome show. It's great to hang with you and just, you know, do our thing without any preconceived notions. It's always fascinating. I'm glad everybody was here and had fun. Love you, buddy. Love you too, buddy. Big love, everyone. Much respect. <laughs>